Praise the Lord. So, what is enough? Part four. Enough means sufficient, satisfactory. What is enough? What is sufficient in this life? And what is satisfactory in this life? So in the part three, we handle certain important things. But I give you what Pascal said for those of you that, that were here about an empty heart. That there's a place that is empty in our heart. And this man said, then is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man. Kind of vacuum that is shaped like God, which cannot be filled by any created thing. Nothing created, no material thing can fill this vacuum in our heart, he said, emphasis added, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. So, um, three important things he said. There's a vacuum in our heart. Let me see even say four. There's a vacuum in your heart. This vacuum, this particular space in your heart, no material thing can fill it. And it's a reality. You know that. I know that. Nothing in this life, material-wise, can fill that longing, that desire, that vacuum, that space in our heart. And so he said, the, the third thing he said, apart from the fact that there's a vacuum, nothing can fill it that is created. Um, and then the third thing is that only God can fill that vacuum. And the fourth point in that phrase of Pascal is that God can only fill it through Jesus Christ. And um, this message is actually based on this, what is enough. Nothing is enough in this life. So in part three, we dwell on um, what we call wind. That sometimes what we pursue in this life is like trying to grasp, trying to hold on wind. And it's hard to do that. It's not even possible when you try to hold on something that is flying or a wind that you cannot even see, actually. It's futile. It's emptiness. It's just total waste of time gasping for the wind. So we went through that. You can go through part three to understand that. And then we went into money. We spoke about money. Money as one of those things that people try to have enough. They want to have enough of money. People work so hard, but you can never have enough of money. And we went through what John Rockefeller said. John Rockefeller said that one of the richest men to ever live said, when he was asked, how much money was enough? So he, his answer also helped us to understand what is enough. He said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And I gave you all the reason why money is never going to be enough. It's never going to be sufficient. You will never have enough of it. Because money is liquid. You can go through what I've said on that. I don't have enough time to explain all that. So part four, let's continue where we stop on morning. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse seven. Ecclesiastes chapter one, from verse seven to it says, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. As big as you see, as wide as... And the river keep running into the sea. The sea will never say, I have enough of water. It's never enough. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not enough. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. So it's just rigmarole. It's just continuously, and sometimes it's very, very depressing. When you see, this, when you see what is going on in life, it's so depressing. People that have money, they're crying. They don't have enough. They, they don't have peace. Some of them don't even have peace. Some want uh, the money to be taken from them. 
so they can have peace back, but too late. Too late. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. By Monday, we all continue the race. We come back again to fuel um, our spiritual aspect of life. Not everybody, not everybody does that. Not everybody would like to come to the church on Sunday to fuel to the church before we continue the race. Some keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The heart is not satisfied with sin. There's no time you go to tell your, your eyes that is enough. Your eyes want to see more. Right now, as I'm talking, some of you are with your cell phone. You are browsing, you know, maybe Facebook. You are browsing maybe uh, your Twitter. You are browsing your um, cyberspace, looking at maybe chatting with your friends. Some of you are doing that, even as I'm talking. The eye is never, is not satisfied with sin. So if, some people, even when they are on the bed, when they lie down on the bed, said for them to sleep, they just keep this phone, they keep this phone on, they keep this phone on. Especially the young one. I saw one sales going on right now with T-Mobile. They want to give break to people from 55 years and above. Thank you. Why do you think they want to do that? They won't want to give that to the young ones. Because young people, they spend more time on the phone than the adults. The, old, the older people, they are, their attention span is even before they look, some of them are sleeping. But, <laughs> but the young people, if you give them that kind of offer, they will run, they will run you bankrupt. Because they can, even some of them, while they are driving, they are still working on their phone. Now the ear filled with hearing. You want to hear more. What did he say? Who said it? To whom? Where was he said? Some of you, even as I'm saying right now, as I'm talking right now, some of you want to even call on your phone. You want to call somebody on the phone. Nothing is enough. But we can go on and on and talk about money. You never have. To, you never have. You never. It's in fact, so many information about money, if I want to tell you or maybe preach on money, we can preach so many parts, we will never end it. But I put some things together as illustrations to conclude that, then we go to desire. Desire is another thing that is never enough. We want to go on that and conclude this part four today. Money is the truest indicator. Money is the truest indicator. So from the spirit of revival, November 1987, this one I took from page 13. From the spirit of revival, November 1987, page 13. The way we undo our money is perhaps the truest indicator of the spiritual condition of our heart. If Christians, believers, born again people, evangelicals, Pentecostals, what have you, Orthodox, whatever you call it, or those that are born again, if we can understand that um, money is the truest indicator, and if we can properly undo money as the Bible wants us to undo it, which will go along with material things, we will have solved 99% of our problems, things that will not make us to serve God properly, things that will be taking our thought away from the most important thing will have some 99% of that. Look at what I brought from that, the spirit of revival. The way we undo our money is perhaps the truest indicator of the spiritual condition of our heart. The Bible contains more than 500 references to prayer. More than 500 references to prayer. And almost 500 references to faith. But there are more than 2,000 references to money and possessions. You compare that. You know, the parable of Jesus Christ, it depends on what uh, document you have read or that have given you this information. Uh, 
the precise number of parables in the Bible varies. So it, it's based on different definitions of parable. But Jesus gave, if we continue to count, more than 30 parables in the Gospels. Especially the Synoptic Gospel. You know what I call Synoptic Gospel? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So more than 30 uh, parables. But from this revival, the spirit of revival, I just want to, I'm reading to you verbatim what is written there. He said, out of that 38 parables that Jesus told in the Gospels, 16 deal with how we undo our money. Out of 38, 16 of that 38, 16 of that 38 explained to us how we undo our money. Jesus said more about money and possessions than about heaven and, and hell combined. Do you get what I'm talking about? Jesus spoke more about money than what he told us about heaven and hell and hell combined. Money is tough. And that's why the love of it is dangerous. It's the root of so many manners of evil going on in our society. Evil, even evil going on in the house of God. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but don't be discouraged. There, is, um, there are three videos now you know, trending about the general of Asia in back home in Nigeria. It's trending, and some of those videos, if you watch some of those videos, you'll be shedding tears. If you watch some of those videos, you ask yourself why. And all because of money, maybe power, maybe fame. Some people, they like, they like that praise. What will you permit a man? Maybe against the whole of these things. Fame, power, money, what have you. I don't want to mention the other one. We have children here. What will profit a man? You ask me, what will profit a man? Maybe gains all these things and eventually loses his soul. There is none of these things you can give in exchange for your soul. So, let me repeat that again. Jesus said more about money and possessions than about heaven and hell combined together. One out of every ten verses in the gospel, this with money or possessions, more than, more. And I think if you want to hear, to get this statistic from me, I can do that for you. One out of every ten verses in the gospel, I'm reading what they put down here. This with money or possessions. 288 verses in the four Gospels. 288 verses about money and possessions. So, from D.L. Moody Evan, Chicago Moody Press, 1975. I think page 108. So, from the lips of millionaires, from their lips. So, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Rockefeller. They have not brought me any happiness. So, he said again, another one, uh, Vanderbilt. I think I got this one right, the pronunciation right. The care of 200 million, the care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. This millionaire said this. He said, there is no pleasure in it. And it is true. The care of money is tough. No rich man wants to go down. And the, the problem of most of these millionaires, their problems is sustainability. How to sustain their position in the society. Some of them, they have gone into some rituals. They have gone into some... Uh, what, are, what language can I use in this one? They've gone into some agreement 
to get some wealth and to sustain it. I was told of a man, I don't know how true is this. I was told of a man that this man had killed 300 people so he can continue to sustain the source of his so-called illicit wealth. The last one he killed, he got into trouble. I won't tell you his name, but he said his son is running around now. His son took off because he said, they said this man always do this thing with his son. You know the story. The man has been asked to be, they, they has the man, uh, they said the man was uh, already condemned to death. But they said the judge who condemned that man to death, to, to, to death they said they used one kangaroo reason and they removed her from the bench. And people are saying that, you know, it's every, it's more, I mean, it's, it's, every, I mean, it's even in this country. The governor has to sign the paper to go and do what? To go and kill him. But the governor is not ready to sign it. Hello? But you can see the trouble. I don't know how true it is. I'm just telling you what they told me. Hello? I'm doing what? Telling you what they told me. But when you see smoke, fire is burning somewhere. Some people can do anything just to get rich. Look at what John Jacob Astor said, another millionaire. I am the most miserable man on earth. A millionaire. This is, this is coming from the amount, okay? J. Paul Getty said, What can I say? I only know I am desolate. Some, as soon as they get money, they will run away from all their friends. But anytime those friends will see them, they are looking for what? They're looking for their money. One time I went to visit one of my, um, you know, one of my uh, manager when I was working in the bank back home. So I was in the school. I went back to visit her. I was talking to her. So many people want to see her. Then she was telling me, you know why they want to come and see me? You think they love me? It's because of this seat. This seat. It's because of what? This be where I'm sitting. It's because of that power. You know, it's a source of, she has the money because she's sitting on the control of that money. As soon as you remove her from that seat, her friends will reduce. Go and ask she, children of those people that their father used to be very powerful in those days and the fathers are dead. Go and ask them what they are passing through now. They will tell you. If the father failed to prepare them very well, they will have stories to tell when they meet their fathers in heaven. Henry Ford. Look at what Henry Ford said. That automobile investor guru. He said, I was up here when doing a mechanics job. I was up here when doing what? What is enough? Not even money. Andrew Carnegie said, Millionaires seldom smile. Why are they not? Why can't they smile? Maybe they are thinking of the misery. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's look at let's look at desire. And because there is no time, let's look at desire. What is enough? There is no amount of what you desire in your, in your heart that is enough. Every time we desire something, even as we sit down right here, you are desiring something, right? You want something. Because that is hope. You are hoping, if I can get this, you hope. When you get that, if I can get it, you hope. Because hope keeps a man alive. Yeah. Hope keeps a man alive. When you hope for this, you hope for this, you hope for that, you hope for that. Once you lose hope, if somebody is sick on the sick bed and that person loses hope, that person can die right there. 
But when you see hope for something, you are still longing for something, you are still longing for something, it can keep, it, that can keep you alive. Keep you alive. And from that, healing can come. Desire is never enough. Don't kill yourself. It's never enough. God will give you what you really need and not what you want or desire. You can desire everything, but God will only want to give you what you actually need because it's not all that we desire that we need. Not all that you want that you need. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 verse 9, Ecclesiastes 6 verse 9 says, Better is the sight of the highs than the wandering of desire. This is also vanity and gasping for the wind. When you just want to continue to wander on desire and you are desiring, sometimes, you know, unrealistic desire will bring serious frustration. Some people are frustrated right now. They are disappointed right now. They hate some people right now. They hate their country right now. They may even hate a very close friend right now because they have unrealistic desire unrealistic expectation. What that person cannot meet, you continue to desire it. And sometimes we desire from, not that God cannot meet some things we want, there's nothing God cannot give us, but if God should give you what you're asking for, that may not be, that may not be, that may not end well. Somebody was talking about some prayers we pray. Somebody said, when you pray, for example, you pray that, that your enemy must die, right? You pray that prayer. And you are the enemy of somebody right now. If that person is praying that you should also die, if that person is praying the same prayer point, they tell it to God, my enemy die, die, die. And you are an enemy of somebody. Don't deceive yourself. You are what? Enemy of somebody. You may not think you are the enemy, but you are enemy of somebody. And that person is praying that his enemy also, or our enemy should die. Everybody is going to die. Everybody is by the grace of God. No one is perfect. James chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Where do wars, where do, where, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that, that war in your members? Desire for pleasures, desire for things that, you know, may it just come for a while and it's never enough. These things cause war in our heart. And sometimes this war ranges to, to the level that we don't even have time to enjoy that which we have that is in our hands right now. That which you have in your hands right now, you don't have enough time to enjoy because you are filled with other desires running around to get more and more and more and more and more. Some don't even have time to enjoy what they got because they want to have more. And may the Lord help us from the spirit of Oliver Twist. Say amen. You, if you read that novel, you always want for what? Want for more. What is enough? You lost and do not have. You murder and convert and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask a means that you may spend it on your pleasures. And God does not want that. So Jesus was teaching, Jesus said, because of time, I'm going to say this one, I think maybe we should pray. And maybe when we meet next, I will talk to you about the, uh, the parable of the rich fool. Maybe I can just summarize it. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, from verse 31 to 33, therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? So when your desire is filled with all this one, these common things that God is even doing, before you, before praying for this, thing, say for all, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek, those who don't know Jesus, they seek all these common things you are seeking. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. He knows he's going to feed you. He knows he's going to take care of you. He knows he's going to you know, undo some aspect, heal you. So he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. 
Okay, briefly, the parable of the rich fool. If you read the account in Luke chapter 12 from verse 13 to 21, then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take it and beware of confessiousness. And that is the key problem that we have that causes us to desire unnecessarily, knowing that you know now, even through this message now, you know nothing is enough, yet you still desire some unnecessary things. It's because of covetousness. We are so greedy. We human beings, we are greedy. Naturally, a man is greedy. We are selfish. We are self-centered. And, and all these things will bring wickedness. Some are so wicked. What is meant for other people? Somebody wants to take the whole of it. How much do you need? You know, Jesus said, we must beware. We must take it and beware of conversiousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life does not consist in the abundance of the clothes that you wear. How many of them that you wear? How many of the cars you can ride? How many of the buildings you can build? I was told of some people, they have various kinds of swimming pools, in their edifice, they built. Some have private swimming pool, general swimming pool, you know, first lady swimming pool, first gentleman swimming pool. They have all this. They never go and swim. In Some of them don't even know how to swim. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of what he possesses. Some they are building have so many rooms. So many what? Rooms. Not one. They got this building all over, everywhere. Some, some are just, they, some, I think they, are, they love building houses. And they don't want to live in those houses. Human beings were, well, then Jesus through this spoke a parable to them. He spoke a parable to them saying the grant of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. He reached it plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my bounds and build greater, and, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose, uh, then whose will those things be which you have provided? Wrong desire brought him his last. Wrong desire made him to lose his life. So, so is he. The same thing of this man, what happened to this man, is also for anyone who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Think, are you rich towards God? I was reading a statistic, 5% of Christians in America financially are financially committed to their churches. 5%. 5%. So, that sometimes, it's not only in this church. How many of you are financially committed to this church? How many people? So, it's not peculiar here. Jesus gave this parable or said this because this man was a rich fool. He was rich, but he was not thinking about the source of that riches. The source of what you have, even the source of your life is God. Are you rich towards God? So that 5% they are talking about, talking about everybody, all the millionaires, everyone going around. There is a president now visiting churches. Sitting churches. Hello? A president, a former president, is doing what? He's now born again. As soon as the election is over, he's no more born again. Ask him how much of the, his money has he given to a church or to churches or wherever he's going around. They all go there to do what? To collect, to collect votes. All of them. A man's life does not consist in abundance 
of what he possesses. If we have anything, think about God, please. Think about God. We are all going to return back to him. And all these things that we gather, all these things that we gather, you do, you do it. You do experiment. When you get back home, take your phone. Hold it tight in your hands. Hold it tight in your hands. Take your phone. Hold it tight. Then go and sleep. When you are going to sleep, I don't know when you sleep, maybe 10 p.m., 9 p.m., or 11 p.m., hold your phone tight in your hands and sleep. And tell me where you go to see that phone when you wake up. Hello? Because sleep is like a cousin to death. Thank you, mommy. It's very close. So all these things, yeah, 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 all this yo 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 that we are doing is because the source of life is still giving us that life. And the Lord will sustain you in Jesus' name. Nothing is enough. Don't think until I have before I will do for the Lord. I'm not, I'm not saying this to begging you to, to do anything, but I'm just telling you it's a common factor. It's everywhere. It's not only here. It's everywhere. People don't care about God. With their time, they don't care. With their treasure, they don't care. With their talent, even some people are talented. They want to give it to God. They, people don't care about God. But do you know that in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. He's the source of everything. He's the source. But we, you will not understand this, that what is enough will not be so clear to you until you have done the first thing. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And how do you do that? You can only seek, the, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You can only put God as the focus of your life if you belong to him. Do you belong to God? You must understand this before I pray. Understand the reason why we have church. The reason why we're in the church, if you get relocated to anywhere, you go to a place, they call church, and the focus is not about salvation. It's not about being born again. It's, not, it's just the focus is on something else. You are wasting your time. If the focus is on all these other things, because a man's life does not consist in abundance of all these possesses, if the focus is on this race, this earthly race, and nobody is telling you about heaven, nobody is telling you about hell, nobody is telling you about salvation, nobody is telling you about holiness, nobody is telling you about serving the Lord, you are wasting your time. That guy is wasting your time. So, if you have not given your life to Christ, and I continue to say it, do it today. Tomorrow might be too late. And I said, it's very, very simple. Sin is a sickness that, that has, has no cure. It has no cure. The only cure you can have for, to cure this sickness caused sin, this cancer caused sin, is the blood of Christ shed on the cross of Calvary. That is the solution. In Christ alone. And it's by faith alone. If you are looking for the real, the real blood flowing, flowing like this, you can see the blood has been shed for over 2,000 years ago. So you can see it again being flowed, but it's by faith alone that Christ did it all in Christ alone. And it's by grace. It's not the work of righteousness. It's by grace. It's by grace. You just have to accept that offer. Know that it is done. Jesus paid it all. Accept it. Take it with, with total repentance. And forsaking of your sin, it's not possible for God to, for, to forgive you a sin you are not ready to let go. You must be able to let go that sin before God can forgive you. Amen? Anyone that covers his sin cannot do what? Cannot prosper. It's only when you confess your sin and you forsake your sins that you can receive God's mercy. Do that. Once you confess you know, and you are ready to let go, the thing is, it's automatic. Christ will come into your life. Holy Spirit will come into your life. Your life must change. There must be a change. If there is no change, there is, you are not born again. There must be what? 
Do not deceive yourself. I, I can deceive you, but when you deceive yourself, it's titanic. There must be a change. You must see the difference between your life now and your life then. Because if any man be in Christ, it's what? A new creation. All things are what? Passed away. All things are what? If all things are still old, that born again is wuru-wuru. It's not genuine. It's something is good. Something, the way you look at life is totally different. The way you look at money will be totally different. The way you look at things, materiality will be totally, the way you look at your time will be totally different. There will be a big difference in all these things. The equation of life will just be with, will not be, will not be, in, uh, will not be, um, able, you will not be able to pass it and make it real equation without Christ being in it. So Christ will take the center stage, will be the focus of everything. And that is when you can have enough, where you can say this is enough. Godliness and contentment is what? A great gain. And the godliness aspect is what we are talking about. You being born again, you giving your life to Christ, you pursuing life now in a different perspective. We did not bring anything here. We will not go with anything. And then you begin to follow Christ. You know, when you are born again, you do what? So what I'm saying now, you'll be agreeing, it, your spirit will be clicking to what I'm saying now. You will be, you'll be loving it. You will want to do something for the Lord. You want to run the race for the Lord. You want to encourage somebody. You want to tell somebody about Christ. You want to preach the gospel to somebody. You want to ask somebody to come and enjoy what you are enjoying. You will do it. You will become an evangelist. Telling others about Christ. And when all things will be brought to an end in this life, I tell you, when you are absent in this body, where will you be? It's a blessed assurance. Nobody can change that. The Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. Our precious Father, we thank you today. We bless you this afternoon for all you have done. Thank you for the fact that nothing is enough. We can only have sufficiency in you. You are the, our sufficiency. So as men that have not given their life to Christ, they are here today. Father, I ask, Lord, that you continue to disturb their heart until they surrender to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever is the obstacle or the delay they have, Father, I pray you will visit them all, that this delay will be taken away, and when they will surrender, they will come as they are, without any complaint. Thank you, precious Father. Blessed be your name. Go with us as we proceed. Even this week, make it to be a great week, O oh God. Make everything new in our lives. Protect, guide, keep, provide as we go. Let us enjoy your peace as we go this week, oh God. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you.